Hello there and welcome back to Roll on the Adventure, where this week we're creating a spy game with multiple spy masters and a single player being the spy. Uh, how are we going to manage it? Well, we're going to leverage some modern technology uh, to, do, to uh, manage our various possibly conflicting plot lines. This time on Roll on the Adventure. Roll, 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 roll. Adventure. Roll on the adventure. Roll on the adventure. Excellent. Nailed it. Again. We're just totally. so good at this. Oh, yes. So, um, things we were discussing. We've had a look at um, various parts of the spy mission genre. We've mm -hmm. had a look at um, splitting the responsibility between different factions. Uh, we've had a look at using technology as a sort of governing system for our game and sort of mirroring that technology a little bit. And I think that we're ready to look at um, actually creating these uh, player roles. So should we start with the spy or should we start with the faction? I think the game inherently is going to start with the spy. Because, yeah. you know, the the game is ostensibly about them. So let's talk about the spy first, I think. I like the ostensibly there. <laughs> so um, if if this game is going to be played with uh, the GMs and the player um, switching roles every now and then, I think it's only fair if if they build the player character together. Mm. Yeah. Or is it? I thought the... Um... The changing role thing we like weren't doing. I think that pretty much got uh, edged out early on. Um, yeah, I, I, there is a, there is a version of this game where everybody takes turns being the spy, but I think at where we ended up, it seemed that you know everybody sticks to a character. It's just that somebody is specifically playing the spy character. GM might be a bit of a misnomer at this point. <laughs> yeah. I think they are kind of still GMs. They are still scene setters. Their characters aren't necessarily going to be in scenes that they're in. Mm -hmm. And in fact, probably won't be for most of it. They're more like directors of scenes. Very true. Sense. Uh, they're definitely taking, so, uh, in the sort of old Forge parlance, they're definitely taking director and writer stances mm -hmm. um, as opposed to player stances, which I think uh, does make them more GMs than players. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I think uh, we used asynchronous in the last in the last um, recording, and I think that's probably a pretty good way. Yeah, to to describe it, you can have plenty of stuff going on because you can have people fleshing out the board with how their faction is responding to stuff mm -hmm. while a scene is in play. Um, but you could also have someone roped in to play the uh, French ambassador. You know, if you if you need someone, so the the uh, spy isn't talking to them. Well, the GM isn't talking to themselves. Yeah, hell yeah, that kind of thing. I thought that's where we would got with the changing roles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like specific people in the scenes and uh, kind of playing the reactions almost. Mm. Yeah, you are playing the concept of America. By the sounds of it, there's probably not going to be. To a great or potentially a great deal not of playing your actual informant character you are in terms of the actual role play a lot of it will be you say you're backing npcs supporting cast and kind of reaction shots possibly yeah uh, the the informant i still think is a character and has a voice yeah oh, yes. um uh, I, I guess that is then up to kind of like a gm personal preference of how much their mm. informant likes to speak compared to yeah. other roles within i guess because it is modern day it's fairly easy to be to make up a justification of being wide in and aware of what the spy is doing mm -hmm. yeah but you could if you want to play it as being a bit more distant and remote i think their primary role you could play them more as like a proper character that the spy interacts with I think their role is less as a, an NPC and more as like a framing device. Hmm. A MacGuffin with an internet connection. They are indeed a MacGuffin with an internet connection and like the promise of many thousands of pounds and some medals if you do this right. Mm -hmm. I mean, or whatever else the, the government is offering you, you know, get your sister out of jail, that kind of thing. 
I mean, is that something we want to explore, like leverage, or I, or is that overcomplicating things? I think it is. Oh no, that's definitely part of spy charge-in, is what does the spy want? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be very different for a spy that's a pure mercenary as opposed to one that's patriotic, as opposed to one that's just doing it because his wife's in prison and he wants to get her out or whatever. So yeah, I think that, that what does the spy want is a very important question then. Do we do we think that we can work on the spy or the spy's agency first, if this is going to be a, third, uh, a fourth power to to the other factions? I think we need a uh, setting first, really. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need to know when we are. The default assumption is probably modern day or, like, you know, a few years ago or a, possibly even a couple of years in the future. Because of the way that I, I tend to work with all, my, with all my fiction, it is either a 20 minutes into the future kind of thing or a jazz punkish retro future, like... This we have modern, if not slightly future technology, but cold wars are still absolutely a thing. So you can tell either of those types of spy stories if you would like. Yeah. Yeah. If we're doing twenty mm-hmm. minutes in the future, I would like it very twenty minutes. You know, it, it it's you know not quite as far as say Shadowrun or something. Well, you know, uh, the cy- cyberpunk pushes things in a slightly different direction with how spies do things very true <laughs> i guess uh so yeah 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 though that would be a different genre of spy entirely i think but you know um slightly better technology than what we can currently do because having access to cool spy gadgets that go beyond what we can purchase in a store is neat but not necessarily like you know flying cars and cyberware yeah that's i think um, that setting discussion is going to be important. Mm-hmm. Um, I think since gadgets are such a big part of spying, that should be part of that discussion. Mm. You know, do we want any? Mo- I, I think also, like setting up maybe a, a couple of motifs would be nice. Has anyone played Red Alert? I indeed have. No, not personally, but feel free to uh, give me the lowdown. So the lowdown is it's um um it's a strategy game uh, based in an alternate future where the Cold War never stopped. The second, mm-hmm. the third installment are more uh, self um, self parodying than actually serious. Uh, yeah. But I, I I like the idea of an alternate present instead of the future, if you know what I mean. Okay, that's really nice. I like that idea. So the Cold War never stopped for some reason, but mm. nothing mm-hmm. else changed. So instead, Russia we still have the Soviet Union, um, but nothing else really changed. So you got all this. Um, so the tech is pretty much the same, but you still have this uh, gloominess and this uh, paranoia and um, the nuclear clock really close to to, to being uh, broken, but. Any anything else is pretty much the same. So what I'm feeling here is that we're gonna write the game with a setting, but have the rules for that discussion as well. Mm. Mm. Like we did for in the end in Primordia, we did like double back and give some like examples for people to use instead of like inventing all the setting stuff themselves. Alternate setting hacks for the back of the rule book, quote unquote, the rule booklet, yeah. I guess in this case. I'm I'm thinking more of the alternate the the hackers at the front. It just says, if you want a quick start, go with this. Mm, fair. Does that sound that sound cool to you guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. I think like having a couple of motifs, like you know, um, like washed out colours or you know rain things like that, would be uh, mm. quite nice. Uh, which possibly also means that later on we'll want motifs for the factions themselves, but I think mm-hmm. we can go on to that when we talk about factions. Alternate history is really nice. I think that's a cool way to separate it from too much uh, actual real day politics that people might not be wanting to do a game about, like right <laughs> now. <you know? laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, um, uh, there's there's endless and myriad discussions about I don't want politics in my RPG. 
I yeah. just want to, and I, I, I laugh at those people. It's terrible. <laughs> um, I mean, there's politics and literally everything, and trying yeah. to sidestep that is a foolish endeavor. Um, I would say by even wanting to have a thing about America versus Russia under any context, you are not going to avoid current political climate discussions therein. Oh, oh so, totally. Uh, <laughs> so why shy away, you know, if you want to kind of take it there? Um, on the same time, this game can be like interpreted by everyone in a very different light. So. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to take a stance. It's just you know random spy stuff. I don't I don't think it will be too polarizing, um, yeah. unless the game the game masters uh, unless the table wants it to. Sure, sure. I mean, I I could totally get down to playing some pretty polarizing like it, like in America political spy stuff. Mm -hmm. That could be really fun. I uh, um, I I guess. Um, it feels like it would therefore, in the same way that there's character generation for the spy, at the same time there is character generation for the factions, rather than imposing that yeah. somebody is America. Because, I don't know, I would probably want to run like a anarcho-hacker collective that have like worked up the money by robbing cyber banks to go in, or at least I'd maybe probably doing more kind of traditional um, social engineering to gain yeah. money to then... Well Pay Bit for a spy. Bitcoin banks, or yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Like I, I think having a set setting, like uh, basically a worked example from the start, would be really cool. And mm. whether we use our worked example or not, we'll see. We probably will, but yeah. uh, I think having the the option to explore what ifs, things like that, gives the game some interesting tax. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd not, I'd not like to rule that out, uh, but I think you're very right in saying that a, a, any spy game is definitely going to get political anyway, even if it's like um, the factions that don't exist. You know, yeah. you you will see pa you will see parallels, even if they're not written in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, like it, you know, look at Seder Krupp, you know, and yeah. things like that. Um, you know, in Shadowrun, you know, people will inevitably draw parallels to the. You know, everyone already draws parallels between like Horizon and I and like Apple and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think especially with spy stuff, you're going to get into that sort of um, what's right, what what is it right that these people have this much power, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but I think being able to pick a lens to see it through is kind of a helpful thing sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I guess then. Um... Let's go for this the, this alternate history because you know you gotta you gotta have that blurb on the back that sets a bit of like flavor. Of, this is the world that we want to sell you. So hey, if we yeah. kind of like uh, put that to this is the alternate future where the Cold War never ended. Also, yeah. we have smartphones because why not? Um, <laughs> and then have kind of like that not your jam. Well, here are some other suggestions of where you could take this thing. Is, yeah, is pretty fair. That's a cool sell. Cool. So we've got a little bit of setting stuff, like mm. where we can introduce alternate history, stuff like that. We're going to have a worked example. I'm just going to get that written down. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing is, what does the spy want? Is that going to be the crux of the, that we then build the character around? Oof. There's maybe three questions that I think that is... Uh... The what does the spy want is definitely yeah. a good, a good, uh, uh, an essential thing to kind of include. What is the spy good at is also, you know, while we don't necessarily have skill roles in this game, having something that they're good at and something maybe that they're bad at is just mm. a really easy way to get a gist of what this character might want to do at any given time. I mean, it's like, what's the weakness in their character? I mean, we can mm. always go for advice. Hmm. Like yeah. what is the I like, you know, if you if you look at Bond and is womanizing, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, a a personal flaw rather than necessarily a skill inadequacy. Yeah, I think um yeah. Personal flaw, vice, how do we want to spin it? Mm -hmm. Is this is this gonna be um a fixed choice or a choice between fixed options, or is it gonna be a free form thing? What do you think? 
Uh, free form three examples. I'm a I free guess. form yeah. kind of person for that kind of thing. I, I would figure that, you know, right. is any kind of given person, if you ask them a spy and they would be able to think of one, even if it's just James Bond and be able to answer those questions pretty easily. Yeah, I mean, like, Bond is um, good. He's good at, like, I don't know, it's more like he's pretty particularly good at playing people, like, off mm. against each other, I think. Yeah, he's very good at that sort of getting side. into a situation. Um, he's not always like in, he's not incredibly competent at shooting his way out of it. It tends to no. go badly for him. I mean, plot-wise, competent. He's an yeah. amazing marksman, but it's the plot is more that this is what he does when it goes wrong, mm. rather yeah. than his plan. This is what he leads on. Yeah, and his vice is uh, the of person. I think just. Um, horrendously underestimating women yes <laughs> that is definitely his major character flaw just arrogance in general but that particularly goodness me i think the arrogance flows with the bond uh-huh uh, like ebbs and flows but i think the the, the womanizing is a very solid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thing that's constant yeah i think that's uh i'm gonna um, word it as vice because i sure. think that's like a decent way to it is a cool word that yeah. makes you think of neon 80s streets and things like that. So cool. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> Great. Um, I think we should lead with what does the spy want? Mm -hmm. um, that should be the first question because then it, that does predicate the other one slightly. Fair enough. Um, yeah. By predicate, I mean it doesn't mechanically. I think it's just going to be there in people's heads when they come up with the rest. Mm -hmm. Um. Maybe a bit of description, maybe a mannerism or two, you know, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because there's going to be a bit where people are d deciding things in secret and this gives them something to do at that time. Yeah, I, I guess though there'd probably be other aspects. I don't know whether this is a like a, a, an experience that I kind of have relatively often, but you guys might have it too, where you've designed a character and you're playing them. And then as you play, you find out something about that character. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, that they hate a particular type of food or that they actually wear waistcoats all the time or they're asexual and you just didn't write that down at the start. But there might be, this might have, if there is a character sheet for this kind of thing, a space for discoveries about the spy. I mean, you could just make a list. Yeah. Um, in Trello, just make a list. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I guess the... Um, um, with the idea that we've, I, I, to part the curtain, we're currently already thinking about having two Trello boards running simultaneously, one that the spy only looks at, and a GM one that has GM notes on it. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the, the, the spy playboard Trello is essentially their character sheet, as opposed to a physical piece of paper. Yeah, it's got their character sheet, it's got their current view of the situation on it, mm. which I think is kind of nice. We'd probably want um, lists for well, each of the GM factions as well, and yeah, we'll work it out. I mm -hmm. think it's uh, definitely something worth worth talking through in some depth. Yeah. Okay, so factions. Um, what are we going to do with them? Again, I like the idea of having motifs for each one. Mm -hmm. And um, when are we going to actually introduce the situation? Like, you know, you're in Moscow or whatever. When does that come up? I guess it's after the factions have been made. Yeah. Or possibly during? Hmm. Yeah. It's going to be fairly discussion-based, so there's some core point. You will need to get the factions and the location out. Of yeah. I don't know how... We probably don't need to be particularly strict with the order. Mm-hmm. I, uh... We, we, we having referenced Fiasco earlier in part of the character design, when you're generating your characters in that, and you're, like, pulling the bits and realising how your characters interact, while you're doing that, you're thinking about the story as it goes ahead, yeah. but there is a separate phase where you commit to it. But yeah. probably while you group discuss what the factions are. Because I think designing the factions is probably an open table thing. Like the person whose faction it is obviously gets final say as to what their character sheet has. But it's like open to the floor a little bit. Since you've essentially designed a world together, you've designed all the kind of setting period. I, I like the idea that the player doesn't know um, which factions the um, the GMs have. So I think mm. the three um, the three factions can be built on the floor, and there's a random system 
um, all the three GMs uh, just uh, pick them in a sense. Claim them, maybe? Just these come up? Between, yeah, between the three of them. Yeah. Okay. And they, you, you put it on the cards and you whack it on the uh, GM board and mm-hmm. that's now your faction. And the, I think it's going to be obvious because of what people are doing, you know, what people are asking for a little bit. But that's fine. It, sh- it shouldn't be guaranteed. That's fine. And lying is easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, if we've already in this uh, in this particular game, we've got our kind of stereotypical comrade style Russian yeah. um, set up and kind of like anarcho hackers. And then uh, the person who uh, the somebody's kind of talking in a really laid back kind of chatty way. And then just in the final part of the game reveals that actually they are the stereotypical Russian communist group. And then it's like, ah, you managed to play me the entire time. How cool. So that's the thing you can definitely do when you're aware of what the goals of the other three factions are. Lying is doable. Hmm, I think so. And I think that can possibly lead to a bit of an odd, like, sort of player setup where they're genuinely just not sure what to do Mm. because they're unsure what information is true or not. But then again, it, we could probably sort of give advice to more rely on what they see, things like that. Mm-hmm. And not everything is a deception, you know? Yeah. I, uh, it's, it's partially why I, I previously made the suggestion of stuff, information that the uh, informants put into the game world is always true. Yeah. Saves that from being an issue. It then stops being about false information, but is more about who to trust. Yeah. And, the the things that are happening are true. The reasons given may be false. Indeed. Yeah. So comments may be false. Um, like cards, like card titles can't be. Mm-hmm. Or you know, card titles and descriptions are always true. You know, comments can be false. And I think it's going to be trying to work out, like, keep people guessing which is which ones are and which ones aren't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There will also be the thing that if one person keeps saying things that make you distrust them. <laughs> you're less inclined to go along with what they say for fairly obvious reasons, so you don't want to be too shady all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, you also mentioned um the resolution mechanic from um microscope in that somebody writes down the answer to the question. Yeah, and I think that is what the uh spy does. That's like yeah. part of the role is that they then write down how they feel the outcome's gone. Yeah. And then that... So so that that bit is obviously not... They're not... The, the spy, hopefully, isn't a mind reader, so doesn't know what the, um, the, 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 the informants have intended that scene to do. But it's honest. Um, it's not necessarily what actually happens. It's... But it is their honest view of it. Yeah. And that kind of... Um, telephone style disconnect and that yeah. level of potential misunderstanding sounds like a lot of fun oh it does yeah that sounds really interesting oh, that's this is uh shaping up quite nicely i think that when we have the three factions the the location and setting um if you have three factions and the player character i think the setting and location is pretty much is going to um deliver itself at some point uh-huh yeah, and um, I think it's probably worth saying that you want the player in on that discussion. Mm-hmm. The uh, I think we're going to need to come up with some uh, terminology. I think player does work, but does it always work? You know. Yeah, I mean, we could just always call them the spy. I don't mind that. I keep vacillating on what to call the GMs. Mm. I've been using informants, which isn't inaccurate. Yeah. But maybe not very snappy. We can do agent instead of spy. So it's a agent. Cool. So it's a wider um, purpose. Mm. I'm not sure. Personally, I feel that agent it kind of comes with a connotation of definitely being sent there, whereas a spy could have been recruited, something like that. For me, that's a, a particular. I um, see. 
Hmm. I mean, I think the the, the proper uh, term is human resource, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I like that one of the informants is just human resources. That's their official <laughs> title. That's great. I mean, yeah. But that's a specific like faction terminology, I think, within a particular like, you know. Yeah. It's it's like handler mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, do they give like the titles could be a giveaway when just someone uh, yeah, just gives themselves a comrade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, that could be part of the elaborate deception. It goes many layers deep. I don't know if you played the resistance, but hey. They are a spy that does like has been contacted by a lot of people. There's mm. you know, they're in a position. There is a lot of stuff going on. Um I mean we need to like solidify the player position at this point, I think, while we're doing the faction discussion. Mm -hmm. As in why is the spy there, do you mean? Yeah, like and why are they going to the spy? Like, hmm. it's not necessarily something they're good at, but it is something that they have. Like, um, you know, access to, like, um, university professors who do side work for the military, that kind of thing. Hmm. That's cool. Like, of often spies are recruited not for their actual skills, but for their position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that then... In the same way that we've got a mini questionnaire for the spy, one of the parts of the mini questionnaire for each faction is why are you interested in the spy? I think that is cool. Um, a very good question, but that should be kept secret. Sure. I mean, that can be... Mm, are you mean like secret, secret, like not even the other GMs know? No, no, no. I think the other GMs should always know. Sure. But that, that bit is done on the GM trial board rather than the regular yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, if if someone goes, yeah, he's part of like this um, like group of people that he went to uni with, um, and gets to go to their secret clubhouse, and mm -hmm. some of those are in government, you know, that's um, that's kind of important. And I think that people can group together to play into that. Hmm. And I think that's a nice thing, and you should be trusting the other GM is not to just dick with your stuff. Mm -hmm. It's going to make it hard for completely new role players to pick this game up, but I think it's it's going to be tricky anyway. Not all games are for all people. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Yeah, I think by its nature, this is not going to be quite as easy to pick up and play with as other games. This is no honey heist. No. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it is. That's the spy. The spy is just a bear. <laughs> the spy is a bear pretending to be a man. So now we've had a look at the spy. We're going to create some stuff. I think then we're going to have to have a, like a bit of uh, downtime, effectively, where the factions discuss, like, uh, like, well, decide for themselves what to place on the on the like the field, basically. Mm. Like um, yeah. a couple of angles, that kind of thing. Like um, a couple of dramatis personae, that sort of thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. How would 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 we want there to be some minimum level of things you have to put down? Like there should be at least I don't know two locations, two um, as you say, dramatis personae, two I don't know MacGuffins or widgets or something else, just mm -hmm. so there's some starting points to bounce off. Yeah, and while they're doing that, um, the spy can sort of do their description mannerism stuff like that while they're having that that decision part for themselves mm -hmm. and then we'll come back in for actually playing them and discussing locations things like that there's a cool mechanic that is frequently used in uh, vampire games that um the players have to dictate how their characters feed and mm -hmm. i think it would be a cool option not, not an option but it, it would be cool to have the player um the spy um illustrate how the dead how he uses dead drops or um how he contacts um you know if he's more into morse code or there's a wiretap or uh, if he gets you know usb drives from a specific place you know uh, to outline the way he communicates with his MO. Yeah. Hmm. His MO. That, that's, a, that's a solid category. I mean, spies or agents or what have you are all about style, right? Like, 
every pop culture spy that you can think of have has their um, flair and methodology, and having that as a category makes sense. And probably would take them some time to write in, so that's a good filler. While yeah, I'm wondering, like, does that how much does that overlap with what is the spy good at, and how much that's going to necessarily conflict with some of the uh, stuff that might get played? But I'm sure mm. we, can keep, we can come up with a way to keep it coherent. I, I, I think it should be just a flavor thing to to show like uh, you know is it number stations is it morse code or things like this not more mm -hmm. in what he does but in how he communicates with the with the agency is in so it just just a basic flavor direction thing instead of a skill oh i get what you mean so so the for example i, I love um, the, the fact in the Americans where they had a, a number station, for example, and they the, their phone at home would ring and somebody would have to say, yes, this is Mr. Jennings. Something in that turn. So the, yeah. the, the character needs to fill, the, the player needs to fill this in for the spy. Um, Ooh. So I'm thinking the actual play of, the initial play of locations, like the important locations, is a montage okay so the initial setup of locations once once the gms have uh, built their lists the the presenting them to the spy is a bit of a montage it kind of introduce the setting effectively yeah mm. yeah i mean we can go back to using sort of cues things like that um i don't know if we'd want to do it for everything but at least a couple I'm worried if this uh, this will contain any conversation um, on the table of actual bargaining and negotiation. I just... say we just ban it. Mm. Uh, negotiation and bargaining, how? Sorry. So, like, you know, somebody wants to see something happening in the game. Somebody else wants to see something else. But if if you play it out as a montage. You mm -hmm. have this thing where somebody dictates a thing, and it's a permanent fixture of the of the game. I'm 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 not saying that this is a good or bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking, how do we feel about that? I mean, at least in my head, uh, how because uh, during the course of play, uh, the the GM's informants are going to be putting things into the world that are then true. Um, it would make sense that in the early stages when there's... there, So they've collectively designed a brief, right? Yeah. That they're going to be giving mm -hmm. to the spy. And then separately, they've also typed out the rest. There's probably... We're probably going to give them like a, a kind of questionnaire kind of thing so they know specifically what things to write as part of their own hidden story like a checklist yeah rather than so a, they're not missing uh, any yeah. kind of important details of their version of the story because then right. otherwise it's the person who writes the best story wins and that doesn't work so yeah 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 all right so it's more of a checklist of things to think about rather than an actual hard requirement mm. yeah i mean i guess one of the things on the checklist is i guess the truth because that's the bit that they're going to have to live update as the game plays mm. out because the truth is always going to be changing until it finally occurs. Yeah, I think the truth doesn't go down as a card necessarily, though. No, no, not necessarily. So it's their idea of the truth. Hmm. Like, there might not really be much of a truth. Sure. Uh, I suppose. Um, but it might be uh, what they think the, like, the, pot the outcome's going to be, maybe. Mm-hmm. Because, say, for example, the play that we're doing, and the players have collectively, the, the GMs have collectively decided that the thing that they're trying to get the spy to obtain is a USB stick full of secrets. What yeah. those secrets might be and the implications thereof will be probably different to yeah. each of the GMs. Is that's what yeah. I mean about what the truth is? That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so it's like, yes, you're trying to. Um, you know that the um, like the Russians have a uh, dead drop in a couple of days, 
and it's going to be some um, information. You've got to get close to the people, find out who's doing it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, the side of that works for any yeah. kind of mission, even if it's wet work, like you need to assassinate this particular person. What is their real job, their real name? What are the implications of this person dying is probably going to be different for all of them. Yeah, um, I think definitely having stuff like the implications on there is uh, mm. really nice. So the um, the actual um, structure of a scene, I think we're probably better off leaving for a little bit because um, I'd like to quickly talk about like scenes you can, you imagine like seeing in mm -hmm. this game. So a GM takes a scene, and mm -hmm. then we're going to go around each of us and uh, quickly go over what we think should be like, sort of almost like a fixture, you know? Okay. So yeah, um, what do you think? Anyone want to go first? Uh, a scene that would occur in in the game that the okay. So um, me as the GM, as my laid back anarcho hacker, because I, I like this GM character now, so I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> um, oh. Goes and uh, voice messages the the spy who's got for some reason a smartphone that will transfer. Um, smartphone messages into Morse code so he can communicate in the way that he prefers. Um, it says, like, okay, so I am going to... Uh, an agent of mine in the area has a map of the air ducts. Go get the map, and the air ducts will lead you to the room where the safe is. Okay. And that is those those bits of information that are essentially in, like, visual novel-style red text the phrase <laughs> i have a agent with a map of air ducts is now a thing yeah. that exists. um the the map has a route to where the safe is is now a thing that exists and then the in response to that the spy then says what they do with that information and then that is the scene that works in that that space yeah. they 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 react to this bit of information that's been given built on top of some of the previous so the spy would be like okay i go to the dining hall where there are lots of people uh milling about but there are two people with red blazers and i know the person that i'm supposed to speak to has a red blazer and then another gm then interjects with their bit of additional information because we've hit another impasse uh, uh, a stage of what to do yeah um a scene that i'd like to see is um the, the We've been building up that um, we're going to go back to this French ambassador. The um, mm -hmm. French ambassador's got um, some links with some people that he probably shouldn't. And mm. you're trying to get information out of him. Um, and so we're going to take this uh, moment and we're going to have um, the spy in an apartment opposite this uh, this ambassador's uh, official compound, um, you know, with, with the big the zoom lens like you know getting photos nice and then uh probably like it's kind of the same it's not the same like physical scene but it's the same sort of narrative block um yeah. just a shot of him sitting down at a table opposite one of the ambassador's aides with this this um like Manila envelope full of pictures mm -hmm. like and then we that's the end of that scene you know the spy decide you know the spy and everyone else decides how it went and we set up for the um like the meet or some the gms get to bid on what the next scene should be who wants to take it mm, i forgot about the betting bit and i think that sort of sets us up everyone's gonna be like "Ooh, juicy what information does he get you know mm -hmm. and we can do that kind of a bit off camera if we want i think well, that's the... one of the things that uh, what's inside that manila envelope is then added to your truths and implications text. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one thing that came up there, I think I, I, I'd like a little bit of a sort of epilogue to each big scene. Mm -hmm. Like a tiny epilogue. The debrief, in a sense. Not an actual debrief, but yeah, a metaphorical one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a player debrief rather than a... Yes, than the mission debrief, yeah. So we got we do any sort of card link stuff like that. Mm. We do the discussion of how it went, and I think anyone can call the scene and say, "I think that's where we need to decide how it went." I think we hammer mm. how it went now, and they've okay. got to say how they think it went. But other people can sort of discuss it. I think it's probably going to be a group consensus thing. Mm. I, I guess what um, in the same way that you know the stuff that the gems write down 
is final. Um, for the how it went, the spy gets control over what's final, and that's the thing that they wrote down. Yeah, I think it's the discussion of how it went is the GMs primarily. The mm. spy gets to have the tiebreaker. Mm-hmm. They get to pick an option, and then we do a little tiny epilogue again, like the um, the Manila envelope bit is the it would be the tiny epilogue. And then we do the spies' response of what they want to do next. I love how subversive that is. You know, in a general kind of tabletop RPG environment where the what the GMs say goes and the players have to live with it, that flipped on its head where what the spy has written down is now how that yeah, went. And then the true. GMs have to live with that is, like, disgusting and great. I love that. But they get to provide the options. Mm-hmm, that's true. And then the player gets to go, ooh, I like that one. Mm-hmm. So I think that could be really nice. Yeah, it enhances the, the player's buy-in as well. Mm-hmm. So more, more interest in any option because they, they get to, to finalise the decision. That's good. It also means you're going to have less points where the spy is just something has happened and they have no idea how to respond. Yeah. So they can yeah. pick things that they think they can respond to. Mm-hmm. Because, you know... Even if they're in a dire situation, they can still feasibly succeed. There's no dice check to say that they fail. Is the only check on their competency going to be narrative fluff? It sounds like it will be, but just to make sure there's kind of nothing else outside that we need to be considering. I personally think that there should be kind of a limit to how many cards you can play, Hmm. but I think it's more going to be a... So not a hard limit, it's like a you're going to have to come up with a good reason if you add more than three. Yeah, there's probably, you probably have a social limit of three facts per turn that you get. Yeah. Or, you know, um, in a City of Mist where you can use any number of powers in your list to add to your dice roll, generally you stop at about three because <laughs> even if you do, even if you're great at filibustering and can justify more, why would you? That's boring. So, yeah. yeah. I think the social limit kind of works. And so I'm saying social limit, two or three facts, two or three links. Hmm. Um, because we want the li- we want links as well. If no one does any links, that's a little bit of a... Um, Ooh, I see. I think it's not tying things back. Mm-hmm. So, and I think tying things back is important. Mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. I've got a uh, Night Vale one-shot game that I've uh, written and run, and that actively dissuades people from adding new things late in the game. Sure. Because you get yeah. penalised for things that you don't follow up on. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. But that's a... Everybody loves a callback. Yeah. You don't want um, things to get too complicated. Yeah, totally. Especially with a like a like improv mystery game, which this particular thing was. Mm-hmm. Um adding too many things is often a mistake groups make. Sure. Mm. So I was trying to avoid that. And so you get you get a score at the end, which is why it wouldn't work for this. Mm. And your score is based on how many parts of the mystery you go through. Mm-hmm. But um if you, each thing that like each like concept that you involve like you create and involve in the game. Uh, has three parts. It has like the the sort of normal real world thing, what's weird about it, and a twist. Mm-hmm. And you get um, like multiple points. You think it's like five points for a thing with a twist and a um, like a weird. You know, it's like if you got all three, you get five points. Mm-hmm. If you only have two, you get two points. And if you get um, just the one, your doctor point. Oh, okay, huh? Um, so it, it it's. It's weird that it makes people think about it in a really different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think that's really workable here unless anyone can think of a good way to do that without just slowing things down and turning it into a bit of point scoring on the GM's part. Yeah, I, I, I can see making links not mandatory but encouraged being yeah. being part of the part of this. I, I forgot that is also a thing that Trello can do is connecting bits of cards yeah. together. I mean, that is a what I'd like to be some of the main gameplay. Oh, I feel that. Yeah. Absolutely. Because even, even if you were interested in only, for some reason, if you're being a selfish jerk and playing this game, even if you're only interested in feeding your storylines in there, you still need to connect them. So linking, mm-hmm. 
is still going to be incredibly important no matter what clues you provide yeah and probably put some encouragement to connect to other people's stuff Mm -hmm. i mean we can spin it as it just gives you more to work with you know it'll mean they're playing into your hands it'll make a more fun game yes absolutely i don't think we need a rule for that really no um who who links together is that the um spy or the um informants both because card links don't have uh, comments so they don't have to be true okay um generally i think that the um, gm should be linking gm board stuff mm. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to to player board stuff so you can link stuff on the gm board and link mm-hmm. it to the player board and it doesn't show up on the player board okay so i think that would be the like they should be doing that and the player links together stuff on their board mm-hmm. so it's their view of it again Okay, definitely. I mean, if, if the GM does something really, really obvious, then, like, hmm. say, these two people are in a meeting together, then obviously there's a connection. They might want to put that if the player's busy playing a scene, mm-hmm. because it's very obvious. What do you think? Uh, yeah, but that, I, I think obvious connections is possibly fine. I, I mean, while this is uh, ostensibly... Uh, an improv mystery game like like the Night Vale thing. Um, as we kind of discussed in the previous episode, mysteries are hard to write if the clues are subtle or hard to divine. Mm. So obvious connections are in fact a good thing. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. that everybody is on the same page about what is happening and why. So yeah. obvious connections are probably encouraged if there is a yeah. way that two pieces of information, even if they're given by different people, can connect together in a sensible way, cool. That's canon now. Live with it. Yeah. I mean, true, true. Some of that might just live on the GM board for now. Mm, mm. But it should be there. I think, I guess, part of the uh, unspoken tenets of play is look for connections even when there are, are none. Um, yeah. Outside of your own, even outside of your own story that will. Well, outside of your own truth that you've written. If you see connections that are cool, connect them, because that's rad. Do it. Okay, so I'm clarifying my wording on the boards and truth. Mm-hmm. Um, on the player board, comments can be false. Titles mm. and descriptions must be true. Mm-hmm. Um, like Linking two cards is a bit of a dick move, but if you're really pushing that the evidence says this for now at least, then that's, that's the thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but on the GM board, everything must be true. Sure. Oh God, there's no reason for lies on the GM yeah. board. That would be so confusing. It's just the way it was being described. It like I don't feel it was obvious, so it's probably worth something calling out for players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I get you. Okay. Um, I think we've got a um a bit of an idea of how we want to wrap things up. So we've got, once everyone's gone through their 20 points worth of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, we'll give them a name. I mean, uh, do we want to argue the terminology right now? Or? Points of intrigue. Intrigue. Uh, I don't want, I, I don't like the, the word points. Let's go for something um, more f- representative of mm-hmm. the genre. So we could say case files or... 20 influence, maybe? I was going to mm. say influence, yeah. That is what they're being used for, is influence over the story. So, yeah, influence makes sense. And I suppose it could be, like, the ability for your faction to um, influence yeah. events directly as well, in theory, if you want to spend mm-hmm. them that way. Ooh. Yeah, in setting, you're probably having to spend resources, call in favours or something yeah. to mm-hmm. nudge things towards what you want. Right. Um, you happy with that, Demetrius? Yeah, just uh, just not points. Like, let, oh, let's, totally. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make it less of a gamist. Um, less gamist. Yeah. Now I understand. Thing. Influence is good. Yeah, I, I mean, I just put points because uh, they're like yeah, yeah. tips, points, <laughs> yeah, dots, whatever. But just you know, less gamist. You know. Yeah, it, totally. Mm-hmm. It it will help, I think. Right. That's the, yeah. Okay. So we've gone through. Everyone's gone through their twenty influence, and now there is the end game bit yeah the finale which is um finale is a for you actually end game is probably pretty on brand for a spy thing mm, yeah i'm just keeping rewriting this <laughs> sorry are you writing this uh using a pen and paper or are you typing it up no no i'm typing it start yeah. okay so we've got end game so each person each, well each faction mm-hmm. 
um, kind of puts forward their view on how the, this actual thing goes down. Mm. I mean, did we just want to do the spy pit again? Uh, the spy picks. I mean, yeah. <laughs> At least in my head, I would say that the spy gets to choose which faction they want to like follow through to the end. Yeah, each faction puts down their interpretation, like, well, idea of how things play out. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, the spy, in, like, kind of, yeah, I think there should be some discussion that like, it shouldn't just be, I say it and I, I can't take anything back. Mm. It's like if someone goes, ooh, that's really cool, I forgot about that. I'm going to incorporate that. I mean, um, um, I guess this is, like, the root selection, but the effect of this truth still plays out. So, in that hypothetical where we've got, you know, um, our three factions and they've each put down the truth of what is inside this manila envelope full of photographs, and then the spy says, ah, I want the um, communist one. And then you still play out a final scene with how that goes, because the spy is still a rogue element in that, right? That's the truth. Yeah. But how the spawned responds to that how the spawned how the spy responds to that truth is still unknown until it happens, right? So that's what yeah. the epilogue is, I guess, is the the spy uh reacting to the collaborative storytelling ending. Yeah. So um the spy takes their pick. Mm. Um we um play out a like a bit maybe maybe play out a scene with the person who gets picked as the mm. leader. And then we do a debrief saying like how everything's ended up again, like a bit of an explanation to the spy of how their world changes because of it. Yeah, post credits. I think it's yeah, it, I think in this it, this one kinda needs an epilogue. In some games I think they're like really unnecessary. Mm. I feel that this one could do with one. What what yeah. do you guys think? Well I'm I'm, I'm... I, I can see it with, and I can see it without. Uh, I think it depends on on the table and the, the people involved. I, I I really like the the post credit scene idea. Um, you know, something intriguing carrying to the next uh, to the next mission or something. But I, I can go with either direction. Hmm. Okay, I'm thinking. The actual so if we're doing an epilogue, it's kind of done in game as a um like a a debrief with, sure. with the sort of winning um handler. Yeah. Uh, okay, the debrief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I thought after this, uh, sort of um um you know everybody goes home thing. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking like there's the, the pick, there's the event. Where mm -hmm. you actually play out, like, um, so yeah, I said each faction puts down their idea of how things play out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's less how it plays out as um, how things get set up for the next scene. So instead of having the spy um, kind of picking their like how it goes, and then having like an epilogue and the spy's response. Mm. which we do in the normal scenes. In this one, each faction puts down how they want to set a scene, and the spy gets to pick the set of the scene. Okay. They play out the scene, and then we do the uh, debrief. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess that means that the, 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 this, this, the epilogue scene, or the, the finale into the epilogue, is the, a longer kind of discussion scene. I kind of feel that that should involve all players are peeing in that scene like it's optional in some of the other bits and pieces where you're doing mm. like the one thing but it kind of feels that this should at least even if the other people are being npcs in the scenario this is where all the actors are on the stage at once doing a thing mm. it's like it's a bit a big culmination yeah because at this point everybody's pretty keyed into the story and the gms yeah. know what the actual truth is because they can see the notes of the person who quote unquote won yeah we we they play out the scene um the um where everyone gets involved and the truth is like the idea is to reveal the truth mm. um so you're like the the um, um handlers like scene goal for this is to reveal the truth dramatically mm -hmm. 
Does that, does that sound cool? With as much flair as possible. Yeah, uh, I, I think it would also serve for a good write-up in the end, you know, something physical for everyone to keep or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, having the, like, yeah, having, like, a typed-out version of it and, like, the Trello board would be a really cool thing to have. Sure. And, uh, yeah, I, um, so the idea is, yeah, to reveal the truth dramatically. <laughs> um, and everyone should be involved, not necessarily as a, as their character, but as something, even if they're just, like, speak, like, answering questions. Mm -hmm. You know, like if this is at the like the American embassy and you're the American player, you're gonna like get them to like drop clues as to what's actually going on, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's a photo on a desk of two people shaking hands in the in like the seventies, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that kind of stuff. So y it's to reveal the truth dramatically. Dramatic voiceovers, people bursting into the scene, tearfully. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. No, I'm into it. And then, like I say, there's a bit of discussion as to like the actual thing, and then possibly an epilogue if they've got time. Mm -hmm. I think, to be honest, the how that's going to actually work, um, the the post final scene discussion and mm. the like debrief, I'm not quite sure how well that's going to work. It might be dragging it out a bit too much. I mean. I what well, I tend as almost a general point of order when I GM to do post credit scenes for every game I play because mm. it's one of those opportunities. It's if it's a particularly stressful game, it gives the opportunity for kind of like some light de stress conclusion, you think, yeah, or on tearful it. farewells, or a way to kind of bring in uh, a reference or a brick joke that was started. Yeah earlier and can find its conclusion it's the opportunity to kind of you know wrap up any kind of uh in this spy uh, system to get a key card you knock to spy out and then put them in a broom closet and then in the epilogue like some a janitor passes by and opens the broom closet and yeah. this agent falls out and you have the opportunity for those small fun closure bits yeah at the end especially since this already feels quite cinematic having mm. credit scenes feels like it's very on brand yeah i think another nice one is if we go for what does what does the spy want we also mm. get to find out if they get it if they have a debrief oh hell yeah very true which is nice i think that ties back into that question so i'm a lot more solid now you've explained like like why it should be there i was i was i was a bit iffy on it okay cool i think we've just about got enough time for each of us to pick one thing we're excited about seeing um when we actually play the game, uh, who would like to go first? I'll go first. Um, I think what I'm mostly excited about is them, um, to, to, to see some sort of personal uh, scenes, um, a way for um, the, uh, how, how the player, how the player, how the, the spy is going to, um, to be involved in the setting and get the hooks and um and create um create a dramatic um representation uh, into the game that's that's pretty much what I, I i would love to see how how this um collaborative um process will will give uh, inspiration to to the, to the player to the spy to do stuff for themselves because it's quite it's quite a narrow maze they have to to guide through and sometimes in there you find yourself so that's what i'm hoping for so it's like that character reveal based on partly what they think is going to be a cool story partly on what is thrust upon them yeah because um a, a lot of expect this game to to have um quite unexpected um situations for for the spy and this might you know in in games with more open-ended or more loose uh design like D, D, you pretty much have all possibilities open and you never you always anticipate something's going to happen you know, it's, um, there's someone hiding in the bushes or it's goblins or, or die worlds or whatever but in in this sort of tight type narrative structure you get to to find more things about the character themselves like the the, the motivations the 
the honest truth about it in oh. in a way that um, uh, Skyfall was had this sort of revelation about Bond's character. I think. Yeah. Um, who wants to go next? I guess there's there's two small things that I guess I'm I'm interested in. Um, one is you know uh, the spy connecting two pieces of information that nobody thought anybody would try and connect, and then a GM frantically deleting everything in their truths and implications and retyping a new one because this new potential outcome is just way cooler. And oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And just voice acting a femme fatale with a punny name. I am very looking forward to doing that. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's not really a spy movie if there's not that scene. Heck yeah. Oh, awesome. So it's all about like the uh, sort of the change that comes onto this canvas that's been uh, there. Because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the story that you've written in your head is cool, but it's not as cool as the story that everybody's made. So, yeah. Awesome. Chris? Yeah, and what I'm most looking forward to seeing is all of the smashing together and collisions between everybody's intended story arcs and what is actually going to end up happening as they careen into each other, the spies doing yeah. their thing, and everything's going to be a bit of a and hopefully entertaining, glorious mess between every, everyone. See ya. I, I think one thing that kind of stands out for me is the sort of spies response bit, that little tiny bit before the betting starts again, mm. um, where the spy is kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping whoever does this does it out loud, kind of wrestles with the, um, like, what they've done, what to do next, like, what their thought process is. I mean, dramatic in the monologues are essential. Oh, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that done based on this quite possibly incredibly convoluted thing that's going on on a board they can't see. You know, they've got their conspiracy board, the GMs mm. have their conspiracy board, and the the whole idea of the spy trying to match the two is going to be really interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, the final question before we say goodbye. We're going to be recording the first um, sessions of the game. Who wants to be spy first? Mm. Do we have any takers? Other people are being silent about it. Since uh, other people were were quiet, I will will step up to the plate and I will be the spy. I will be the worst spy, by the way. You will not get a competent spy. (laughs) Okay, this is absolutely fine. Well, uh, would you like to sign us off, Nathan, seeing as you're the spy? Ah, we will see you all next time on this uh, upcoming spy adventure. Look forward to Agent Blades in the theatre near you. Bye! 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 Stop that!